Shawnee word of the week. Min ki get seeds. It's pretty cool. It's about that time of year again when everyone wants to get outside. Everyone wants to get moving to see some programs. And this time of year in museums can be pretty busy because we're getting ready for the warmer season. We're getting ready for all of the visitors coming back like passenger pigeons all coming home at once. Digital programming is a great way for museums and other educational programs to still produce content and still inter interact and engage with visitors, just not necessarily in the way that we're used to. I have three topics that I want to cover with you today in the digital world that you can learn from, take notes on, pause, rewind, and then share and hopefully other people, your friends, will get some use out of them as well. But before we do any of that, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Talon Silverhorn. I'm a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee tribe, and I am here to tell you a little bit about history and culture and identity through material objects. We're gonna go through clothing, the first video of this video. We're going to go through tools, stone and metal tools. And we're also gonna talk about decorative arts. Clothing and tools are very functional, but have some beautiful aspects to them as an art one and of themselves. But decorative arts, like quill work or embroidery, these things really serve no functional purpose, but they are an expression of identity and culture through the material arts. Everything that I've got on right now, a hat, a hoodie, t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes, technically are still all native clothes because a native person's wearing them. But these are not the things that people think about when native clothing come to mind. Most of the time, people are thinking about leather and buckskin and fringe and feathers and beads and paint and Hollywood, right? But let's take a look at what some historical clothing actually looks like. We're gonna focus on the 18th century for a lot of these things, but we might jump back and forth between time periods. Don't worry, I'll let you know when we're gonna do that. I have here in front of me a bunch of things that relate to 18th century clothing. I'm gonna go ahead and go get changed and I'll meet you back here in just a few minutes. Ah, that's better. Well, here I am in 18th century clothes. Sometimes we'll refer to these as traditional clothes or historic clothes or kit even. Now, I could talk to you about Lord Dunmore's War or Benjamin Logan or George Rogers Clark or the Virginia Military District about any of the history that we're familiar with in any clothes, really. I could dress like a sea captain or I could dress in a suit and tie or I could dress even in a clown costume and tell you the same information. But when we're dressed in historic clothes, I'm able to talk to you about the materials, the industries that produce them, the dyes, the colors, the techniques, the fashion of the time, the, the mindset of the people who are producing and buying these goods, shipping them across the world. Instead of leather, like this right here, most of the clothes that we see in the 18th century are made from linen and wool and silk, um, decorated with glass beads and quill work. Um, depending on where you're at, you're gonna find a pretty wide variety of styles and clothings and fashions, patterns, colors, cuts. There are all different things that people like, just like today. Even the clothes that I was wearing just a second ago, we all know what tennis shoes are, but your tennis shoes likely look just a little bit different from your neighbors. You may even wear the same size shoe, but you like blue and knit tennis shoes, and they like leather tennis shoes in solid, clean white. Your hoodie might look different from your neighbors. Just the same that my match coat is not gonna be exactly the same as any other Shawnee person's. My shirt is gonna be decorated just a little bit different. My leggings might be a certain style or cut. Something that's common to my peers in my area, just the same way that you're still wearing a hoodie, but you get to choose what design's on it. You get to choose what color it is. 
based on what's fashionable. Shirts like these are not being made too much by native people in the 18th century. This is a white linen shirt, just plain bleached linen, being made by people in the colonies or in England and being sold or traded to native communities all throughout the 18th century. In 1789, Fort Detroit requests over a thousand yards of white linen cloth to be sent from or to the fort to be traded out into the Ohio country. That's over five and three quarter miles. Imagine that five and three quarter miles of cloth to be made into shirts. 500 dozen black silk scarves to go around the head. Lots of blue cloth, a little bit of red cloth and other fashionable goods like silver, brass, other jewelry, nose rings, rings, earrings, burning glasses. There are lots of things that are coming from all over the world. Lenses from Germany, silver from England, guns, powder, shot, printed cloth from Asia, and the items that we used to wear like this, brain tan deer hide, deer rawhide, possum, raccoon, otter, beaver, they're being shipped to those same places to produce their clothing, their shoes, their belts, their hats, their book bindings, their saddles and tack and upholstery and riding gloves and breeches. They're being used to produce felts of all different qualities. And fashion is driving the trade industry in the 18th century. Now, a lot of what I'm wearing is actually interpretations of Shawnee fashion, just translated through materials. The match coat, the shirt, the leggings, the moccasins, the garters, sashes even, all of these things are being made prior to European arrival in some form or fashion, but maybe just out of different materials. One of the biggest misconceptions about our clothing is that it's entirely leather. And that's actually not the case. A lot of our clothing, I would say, depending on the time period, could be as much as 50-50 cloth and leather. Depending on the season even, maybe the only leather item you would be wearing are a pair of moccasins. Everything else could be woven cloth of some form or another. That's really cool to think about. This linen shirt is made of threads pretty fine, maybe about size five or so threads. There are textiles found in the mounds of Ohio, 2,000, 3,000 years old, that are almost as fine as the linen cloth that I'm wearing right now. That's pretty cool. We have no idea how large the textiles were. We have no idea what the items were, but we do know that people, Shawnee people, Cherokee people, and other tribes in the Eastern Woodlands are spinning and weaving cloth that is almost, if not just as fine, as the cloth being made in Europe at any given time. Animal hair, such as dog, beaver, bear, possum, and buffalo, are being stripped off of animal hides, washed, and then spun into yarn to be woven into garters, sashes, bags and other items, hair ornaments, even being bleached and dyed red, yellow, green, black, with white shell beads woven into the fabric itself. This is a pretty direct challenge to the very drab color palette that most people imagine when it comes to tribal people. Most people are thinking a very beige, very brown sort of color palette, but in a lot of cases we see even leather being dyed red or green or painted. We see the cloth that we weave being dyed green, red, black, blue, orange, pink, purple. So you can imagine there's probably a lot more color in the ancient world prior to European arrival than most people would realize. The difference is the effort, the labor that goes into producing these things. The match coat, for example. This match coat is a pretty direct correlation to some of our earlier, what we would call mantles, right? Match coats are items meant to be worn about the shoulders. Uh, they are a sort of decorated blanket is usually the most common way to describe them. They're decorated with silk ribbon and glass beads. and uh, They're made from a really nice wool cloth, 
They could be blue, they could be white, they could be red. Uh, there's any number of colors that you can make uh, match coats out of, appropriate to the 18th century. But if we wanted to take it way back, I would show you an item like this. This is a woven piece of cloth. It is a twined textile made by hand and fulfills almost the same purpose. It's a fashionable garment, but it also serves a functional purpose of keeping someone warm or even maybe a little bit dry. But the amount of labor that goes into producing something like this, a mantle like this, versus a match coat, really isn't that much of a comparison. You have to collect the dog bane or basswood or nettle or milkweed, wait for it to dry, process it into fiber, and then turn that fiber into cordage to even begin weaving. And then you have to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours weaving every single row twist by twist individually by hand. Now, imagine someone comes along and they have 20 of these, almost ready made. All you have to do is decorate it the way that you want. I want you to think about it exactly the same way when it comes to native fashion as time changes. We like new things. We want convenience. We are people just like any other and we're looking for the easy way out. Think about this wrap skirt. This wrap skirt is made from leather, uh, entirely from leather. It's sewn with leather um, and at the bottom you can see there some painting uh, done with red ochre pigment, red earth iron oxide pigment. and it's very nice, it's very pretty, it's very soft leather, but same thing. That wrap skirt, just the leather itself, you have to kill a deer, process that deer, including skinning it, flesh the hide, dehair the hide, lie the hide, then you have to scrape it, you have to soak it and wash it a couple of times. You have to take the membrane off the hide, stretch it out on a frame, and then begin the tanning process. All in all, it takes maybe three days, three to four days to get a hide from green, which means fresh off the deer, to a finished product like you see right here. And even then, what is that compared to simply buying two or three yards of cloth to make a match coat or a wrap skirt from. The convenience of trade in the 18th century is really why our clothes begin to change so drastically. Think about beads. Beads are a classic example. These are bone beads. They're carved by hand, polished by hand, and think about the number of bones you have to have before you can even start something like this. These are glass beads. These are still kind of made by hand, but it's a much faster, more mechanized process. And even then, the beads come ready-made in a bright variety of colors. Blue, green, red, black, purple, striped, checkered. I mean, there is all kinds of variations of beads traded throughout North America, Africa, you name it. Italy and what will become the Czech Republic have a pretty good corner on the market of glass beads in the 18th century. So the next time that you go shopping at the store for new clothes or new shoes or a new purse or maybe a new hat, I like hats, think about what it must have been like when those things first came out, when those style of hats first came out, when that pattern of shirt first came out. Imagine seeing that for the very first time. And imagine all of the people in history who have had that very same feeling. Clothing seems like such a basic thing. It seems like so normal and so mundane that it's not really that big a deal. But it tells us so much about the mindset of the people who wear the clothes. It tells us how they think about themselves. It tells us how they think about other people. It tells us how they think about their world. So as we go about the next couple of videos, keep that in mind. Look for things that tell you about the mindset of the people that created them. Anytime you think, wow, think about the wow that it would take to make that for the very first time.
to invent a wrap skirt, to invent metal tools, to invent beads. They're more than just objects in the ground. They're more than just a necklace. They are a direct link to the people who made those things. So find something in particular that strikes you the most and run with it. Write about it, draw it, record a video about it, tell a story about it. Maybe write a story about the person who made that thing. That's my assignment to you. Let's get started.